So there is a classic painting called An Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump. And I'll just show you the painting. And what it's showing you, or what people are starting to figure out, is that there is something in the air that we need to exist. And that thing turned out to be oxygen. And animals need it, plants need it, all kinds of organisms need that oxygen. Not all living things need oxygen for respiration. That's not what all things do, all living things do, but a majority of them will use that. So we're gonna look at today the oxygen and its place in respiration. There are lots of really neat gifts out there, and one of the neat gifts you can buy is a glass sphere with a little shrimp living inside it. I'll show you a picture of that, and they sell them, and it's completely enclosed, and somehow that shrimp survives. It doesn't run out of oxygen. How the heck does it do that? Well, if you pay attention to what goes on inside that sphere, there's actually algae growing in there, and that algae does photosynthesis. So that little shrimp will work around that particular container, eating the algae, and also breathing in the oxygen that that algae is producing. And in return, I guess you would say the shrimp is breaking down some of that algae and giving it some fertilizer back. So they are working together, surviving in this self-contained little orb. I don't know what the record is for how long something has lived in that little container, but I know some have lived for many, many years um, just uh, working off of each other. So we're going to look at that yin and yang of respiration and photosynthesis, but with some simple science tools. So let's take a peek at that. I'm sure we all know that we use oxygen. We're not alone. Plants also use oxygen, and we are taking this oxygen in to break down our sugar, and it releases carbon dioxide, water, and the whole reason for doing that, some energy, and we usually call that energy ATP. So that's respiration. We're gonna do an experiment to prove that you produce some of that stuff, and I use prove in loose air quotes, uh, and then we're also going to show you how a plant uses CO2 to do photosynthesis. So let's get started. Uh, what you are going to need, it's pretty basic stuff. You're gonna need a cup of water. You then need some type of acid base indicator. You can use cabbage juice. I used to use that all the time in middle school because uh, I was afraid kids would drink some of the chemical uh, indicators. So you can use those. You can look online to see how to make some uh, cabbage juice indicator. But I'm just going to use Brome Final Blue. It's relatively uh, not dangerous, so that's why I'm going to go with that one. I'm going to put some in there, and if you add CO2 to water, you can change water, which is around neutral, which is a pH of 7, maybe a little less than 7, but you can change the pH and bring it a lot lower than that. You can bring the pH down and we'll see, um, as we know with indicators, you're gonna have a color change. If you do that, that will further our understanding that yes, you do produce carbon dioxide, which gets dissolved into that water, which makes it acidic, which will change our indicator a different color. So that's part one. Part two, um, do you produce water? from burning sugar and oxygen. You do, you know, you can breathe on a camera lens whenever you do with your glasses. You're producing water. Is that coming right from the mitochondria? No, but you are producing some type of water, so I stress that part. And then you are producing some energy, and I say like we're doing movement, we are producing some form of heat, so that's that energy being released. So let's try the bromthymol blue in plain water and add some CO2 to it. So I'll show you down here. If I were to run a hypothesis for this experiment, I would say if I produce CO2, then the indicator will change. And in this case, it did do that. So what I started with was that blue color 
and now I ended up with a uh, greenish color. It is possible to get a yellowish color in there sometimes. Um, I didn't cover my hand over the top, but I often will cover my hand over the top or use an Erlenmeyer flask because it's less likely to splash on a student while they're blowing bubbles into it. But again, we are now in the COVID time, so you know, using something like this is just not possible. Uh, maybe in the future it'll be able to be done, but currently it is not something that we uh, would do in class. So it's just set as a demo like this. Okay, so that is the produ uh, production of CO2. So now I'm going back to this stuff. This stuff just does not leave. This is my pond scum that I've been growing again in the back of my classroom. And it is an aquatic green plant. And I want to know... Does this aquatic green plant use CO2? So I'll have my students try to figure out what experiment could we set up to prove that plants use CO2 to make sugar through photosynthesis. So eventually, maybe with some direction and guidance, somebody's gonna say, well, if you take this solution that has CO2 in it, that's the key, is you want water that you've blown bubbles in. And if I add this green plant to it, and then put it in the test tube, set it in front of some grow lights, or set it by the window, it should take the CO2 out of that water, and then it turns it back to blue. So if this stuff turns back to blue, I know the plant took the CO2 out through photosynthesis. Voila, there it proves plants use CO2. With photosynthesis and I'll air quote that okay so let's give it a shot now full disclosure here I do cheat in this portion of the lab I've done this for 20 some years and I've cheated 99% of the time if you take green plants and put them into this solution and let them sit Typically what happens is either the plants die and then the water changes color uh, to like more of a yellow, it just doesn't work out. So to prove my point, I will go in and add a base to this indicator to bring it back to neutral. And I show the students and act surprised that, oh my gosh, the plant took the CO2 out. Trust me, it does. I just do that for the visual. For that aspect of it so don't tell anyone but that's what i do so now i'm going to set up the second portion of the activity so i've got my test tube i've got my green co2 filled water and i'm going to put a decent amount in there like so well that one i need to add my plant material into so i somehow have to get it out of the ziploc bag I'm gonna use my wife's kitchen spoon. Don't tell her I put pond scum on it. Oh now. Shake it around, get that plant material down in there. So there we go. I've got my two containers. I've got my control group and I've got my experimental. And I'll put that in front of the window for about a day. So next class day, we should see some results. There you go. That's it. I hope that that shows you this one. Can't really see it, but it's definitely a lighter color than the one that did not have the plant in it. I'll hold it up behind the paper so you can kind of see the difference there. And hopefully that shows that plants, in fact, take that CO2 out of the water and use it in photosynthesis. So if we were to look at the equation for this set up we've got for respiration you need oxygen you need sugar you put those two things together in the mitochondria you will get carbon dioxide water and energy for photosynthesis you need carbon dioxide water and sunlight to run this experiment it will produce sugar and oxygen the two things we need for respiration. So you can sort of now see that yin and that yang of how those two equations are linked together. 
I hope that makes sense. And I hope um, you learned something from that. Pretty simple, but still entertaining experiment. Okay, on to the next one.